which belongs to English. I think the majesty of I will speak in English, English, but that but English is false language. You're English. much more comfortable talking in English than this in our own mother tongue. This country has 11 official Asia languages. Asia is becoming English. English is a very difficult language. We have been trying to revitalize our language. A high proportion of all internet transmissions English are in English. The universal Something language like a quarter of the world's population speak English now. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. The ANC will pursue the armed struggle against the government as long as the violence of apartheid continues. This will not stand, this aggression against uh, Kuwait. All the planes from this In the 20th century, the world became a smaller place. The birth of satellite television news, driven by economic and political interests, brought events from once remote parts of the globe into the living rooms of the English-speaking world. The first global television broadcaster was CNN. It used to be a cozy support system for American travelers. They used to be able to go into hotels around the world and punch their TV set on in their hotel room and, you know, and get news from back home. Now, that's a dilemma because this year, you know, 2000, about 1% of the audience of CNN overseas is American, either traveling or expatriate. The majority of people who watch us overseas have English as a second language. We've now got to a position where, you know, 9 out of 10 of our programs aren't even transmitted in the USA. So we've created a truly international version of CNN. So our use of the language has now got to be much more precise than it ever was a few However, years ago. I must tell you, inside that building, it is filled with riot policemen, and it is likely that now the police has managed to, 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 to keep control, or at least to keep the crowd under, under control. Those tear gases dispersing most of those... We've the deliberately program. tried to de-Americanize ourselves. You know, CNN, either the US version, or the international version is not an ambassador for US foreign policy, but it can be perceived as such. Foreign, by the way, a banned word at CNN. Uh, Ted Turner banned the use of the word foreign in scripts or in conversations, you know, 10, 15 years ago. He did it not because he's, you know, um, um, just passionate about the world, but because he believes, what does foreign mean? F foreign means alien. We don't broadcast aliens, or not just yet. We broadcast to people around the world. And, and the, the simple, if you like, um, reconstruction of the English language in that sense publicly to his staff, senior managers like me get fined $100 for every time we use the word foreign. So this interview has now cost me $200. The development of global news networks like CNN has been made possible by the widespread use of English and is a reflection of the singular importance of America in the fate of the language. That America became an English-speaking country at all rests entirely on the foundation of British colonial settlements in the 17th century. The people who settled this place in 1630 were Puritans, English men and women who had decided that the Church of England was not pure enough for them. And so they came here to the New World, to their New England, it very quickly became apparent to them that they were different from those they had left behind in England. Separated from a distant authority in London, the colony became increasingly resentful of British rule. And when Parliament sought to impose taxation, their anger knew no bounds. When they tried to impose these new laws, when they tried to collect these taxes, we resisted. As we resisted, they stiffened. And so you have this escalation, uh, this tumult, and eventually, of course, over the edge into violence, into war, into revolution and independence. No longer British, the newly independent colonies nevertheless set about framing a constitution which eloquently asserted their cherished ideals of freedom in the language of the former oppressor. This is the printed copy of the Declaration of Independence. The Declaration was printed to be sent to the 13 colonies and to be sent to the various elements of the American army. Washington read a copy of the Declaration to his army and the Declaration was read here in Boston from the steps of the old State House. 
And this is the copy that indeed was circulated. This is the text that Americans first saw announcing their independence. The United States, when they became independent, weren't even sure what language they were going to be speaking. They knew it would be something that derived from the language of the British Isles, but English, after all, was the language of the nation uh, whose shackles they had just cast off. And there was a, 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 an important movement in this country that lasted really for the first 50 years of nationhood to redefine the language spoken here as American or federal. This was something supported not only by the American lexicographer Noah Webster, but by figures like Jefferson and Adams. So there was no question of declaring an official language. But the dominance of America by people who could trace their family origins back to Britain was not to last for long. Within the first two decades of the 20th century, more than 14 and a half million people poured into America, the majority of them from non-English speaking countries. For the millions who passed through New York's Ellis Island, their first taste of America was a far remove from the promised land. Huddled in the cramped and impoverished tenements of the Lower East Side, they were excluded from the wider society by their inability to speak English. The remnants of these linguistic ghettos remain to this day. I'm Dick Kressler, and I'm a big Apple greeter. We are volunteers that show people around New York, and today we've been asked to do a multi-ethnic tour showing the wave after wave of immigration that's come into the city. So we're setting off to the Lower East Side. The city center is over to our west, and this was the area that the Chinese were here, the Italians were here and the Irish who were here. Further up, we're going to see where the Germans came in at Thompson Square Park. And so it's had wave after wave of integration. I'd like to take you to the Henry Street Settlement House. Uh, it's one of the first charitable institutions that worked down here with the immigrants and has been through all the waves of immigration. Henry Street has been helping the neighborhood for, for years, right? Teaching. Education, education is very important. Right. Because, you know, it opens, you know, uh, ways for people to empower themselves. I came to America when I was 15 years old. And even though in Puerto Rico they teach you basic English, I felt humiliated because I was, you know, put in, in a class that no one knew a word of English. And they all my grades were you know, all my classes from, that I brought from Puerto Rico, they would drop and I had to start all over again because it's a, a problem. Every immigrant that comes here is going to encounter that. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. Fundraising for our men and women recovery home. We house, clothe, and feed men and women who are homeless, bound by drugs, as gang offenders, and battered women. We do it through fundraising and donations. Would you guys like to be a blessing and give a small donation? Well, we're in Little Italy, and I want to take you down a little further where we can find some nice Italian merchants. I'm going to show you Italian neighborhoods. They were Italian areas, but they were all segregated by where they're from. There are certain streets that if you weren't Neapolitan, you didn't live on, or if you were Sicilian, you didn't live on. We're looking for Little Italy. <laughs> Literally, it's right down Mulberry Street. She said go right down Mulberry. She doesn't know where the Italians are either. We just wanted to see Little Italy. Did you see Little Italy? Yeah. Where are we find some good... Okay. We want some good Italians to talk to. Oh, well, I'm an Italian. I'm an Italian. Are you? It's been not very good. <laughs> I'm Italian. I'm are you, Sicilian. Are you born here? Good. I was born at Kenmere and Monster. Right. In my godmother's bed. Because my uncle and my father were drunk. <laughs> and they didn't make it to the hospital, so I was... <laughs> anyway, so I uh, came here and here. But this is right this here. Is the center of the little island? Yeah, the way I'm pointing right now, right the center, right? Right. That's, uh, this is, this is, this is uh, Mulberry, that's Mott, and yeah. then you go about three or four blocks out that way until it becomes Chinatown.
How many yeah. languages do you deal with? Well, I speak Spanish in here. I, I speak Chinese. I have a helper who speaks four different dialects of Chinese. And um, That's interesting. You know, we have Russian customers, a lot of Spanish speaking, and you right. know, mostly English. Foreign people are moving to the area, a lot of Europeans, a lot of Australians. And it's really changed a lot from heavily Jewish area to Chinese. <laughs> Now, I don't know about London, but the Orientals and Asians have taken over the fruit stand and vegetable business. What? Do you speak English? No, no, no English. No English? No. No English at all? No. Do you speak English? No. Thank you. Within the uh, Community Healthcare Network, we oh, have staff many? that speak 13 different languages because we have nine health centers within New York State. And staff in each center speak the language according to the community that we serve. Like here, we have Chinese staff here that do speak several different languages in the Chinese um, community. Most of the patients that we speak does not speak English, so we have interpreters here. This is the English-speaking country, but then sometimes people see English as the hardest language. The historic process by which America absorbed immigrants from around the world continues to this day. At the English-speaking Union in New York, new immigrants still grapple with the difficult process of learning a foreign language to gain access to the English-speaking society. The English-speaking Union is a non-profit membership organization. It was founded originally in Great Britain in 1918 and then two years later in the United States and the idea was to bring together um, people from both countries using English who used English as a first language um, for friendship and cultural exchange and for education. We do projects and programs that have spun out of what we call the English in Action program between someone who speaks English as a first language and a newcomer to the country. They can be either uh, immigrants to the country or people here on short-term assignments of one kind or another. The English-speaking union uses volunteer New Yorkers who work on a one-to-one -one basis with new immigrants helping them to develop their English language skills within the context of it's informal conversations. <laughs> they say more bang for the buck. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> now, that's an American, that purely American, do you think? I mean, do they have basketball in Colombia? Of course, but this is, you know, the, the, the quality of yeah. our basketball is terrible. What do you say to that person? You're, that's really off base. I don't want you to say that again. Oh, this is good. I can say it on a subway. <laughs> That's right. I was taking Especially. some classes in an ordinary school, which I got so bored because they only teach you grammar and you study from their books. And I, I thought, so my friend said, why don't you just go to this in English in action and you can do one to one conversation? The chief executive officer was really off base with his predictions about earnings. Is there not? It was outside. It, it means he was wrong. Completely wrong. The idea of being able to communicate with somebody and to communicate in ordinary, everyday English and to talk about idioms and all the expressions that are part of the English language, that's what's, what's enjoyable. Give me a compliment right now. You are very well dressed. <laughs> Mm, that's a compliment. Now the but that's a bad sentence. It's, it isn't. I'm, I'm glad you, you uh, detected that. It's not a great sentence. No, it's not a great you, sentence. You could have changed that yes. easily. Yes. Can I say, please, I plead you to help me. No, no. no. Please, I ask you or I beg you to help me. A, word, a person can use this word to say, please, do me a favor. I'm the last of five children of uh, to, to, Sicilian a, immigrants. A, a I was born here. And we lived in Little Italy when it was inhabited by Italian immigrants. And I could see from my family, my parents especially, that the language was a constant problem for them. And it, it hindered them in trying to enjoy the benefits of living in New York. And so I could understand a little bit what some people are going through when they're here 
and they have trouble communicating with other people. So it's something I feel is important to do, and I enjoy doing it. You're begging for something. You're asking for a favor. Going back to off base and touching base. Mm -hmm. There's so many cases of people whose lives have been changed by the advantages that they've been able to get through their partners here, and that really is our job. You know, as a as a nonprofit organization, our job is to change lives, and 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 we have. We've done it. While English has an established role as the first language of the United States, in South Africa, it serves to underpin a richly multilingual society. This country has 11 official languages. Uh, we print the star in English, but that does not mean that now and then words that are of African origin, of African languages, do not come into the star. Sometimes it's because it's convenient to use them. Sometimes it's a deliberate effort to introduce other elements of the national um, heritage of languages that we have here to a wider uh, circle of readers so that all people can start to understand each other. That is what language is all about. Zanele Mgadi is a junior news reporter on The Star. Brilliant. Okay, which one are we doing? We're going to Randburg. It's the family murder. It's the 20-year-old who killed his parents. It's a wonderful, wonderful opportunity to write. It's going to be a very emotive story. You're going out to speak to the neighbors, to speak to the family. The thing is, we have to try and get more detail on, on what happened. Why was this uh, guy angry? What made him kill his mother? And um, just for people to understand what exactly happened. I'm going to try and get a human interest angle. I hope I do, but I just have to speak to as many people as possible. Maybe I'll find out something that nobody knows yet. Hey, see, this is the guy who killed his mother with a fork and okay. his dog and his gardener. Thank you. Follow the leader. The majority of people we interview have a mother tongue other than English. For the most part, our reporters go out and interview those people in that language so as to communicate more effectively. While they're doing this, they've got to actually assimilate this information in English. And how many, um, uh, how many different languages do you speak? I speak Zulu, Tosa, uh, Swazi, uh, English a bit of Afrikaans and a bit of Sutu. The possibility of losing uh, nuances and um, idiomatic expressions is always there uh, in, in any translation. And um, that is one of the big challenges that actually happens here. Okay. And the, the bigger danger is actually when you send a white reporter to go out and interview a black person who might not even uh, be proficient in English themselves. There was one very, very interesting story a little while ago. A young man who had been painted white in Belfort, and uh, it, he was painted white by a white farmer who was very, very scared, he says, when he saw this young black man trespassing on his property. And always in situations like that, it's very difficult to decide who you're going to send out in a story because sometimes you need to send out a white reporter who can go and relate to the farmer because you're not going to get that. You'll get a great deal of hostility if you send a black reporter out who's going to speak an African language. At the same time, you need to send a reporter out who can speak an African language because you want to go and interview that person's family and you want to get that, that side of the story. So not only time consuming, but it can also be a bit of a drain on resources because very often you then have to send two people so you get both sides. It doesn't look like they're home. When did that actually happen, though? I think it happened last night or early this morning. Apparently it was in full view of the neighbours. The neighbours actually saw him impaling his mother with this hmm? fork, garden fork, sir. Just gone find out across the road from me. We all know one, but we don't know anybody even the girl's stuff. We don't know anybody. Whereas, Hamburg girl, Angers number one. 
one two utala basilizala baso unaita sisi okay yeah give you the long use and then don't yeah no ma unga buza usha ubuze any girl i'm not she's working to english for three times why would she do that you sometimes you express yourself better in a different language um and you'll break into that language if if you know the person you're talking to understands it I obviously wouldn't I wouldn't go and talk to her because um, I don't understand um Pedi or Twana or Zulu or Sutu, what she does. Even my brother doesn't know where I'm working. I we haven't got even telephone number. Okay. We're still very new really. Yeah, they're both Thank you very much. English is one of those languages that are understood by most of the people that we cater for, number one. But it also somehow escaped the legacy that Africans as a language uh, uh, got itself settled with of being seen as the language of the oppressor. I don't know how English escaped that because the English were not necessarily uh, um, freedom fighters for black people in this country. Yeah, well, um, <laughs> the police instructed me I mustn't talk, but you work together sometimes with the police. All I can tell you that when my daughter came, she says, Mom, I see uh, the neighbor boy sitting in the street with his bleeding hands and um, I think he was sitting here. Um, uh, uh, the neighbor from next door had came running when he heard the woman scream while the son was killing him. No? And we found the two dogs behind this wall lying neatly next to each other but stabbed to death with a, with a garden fork. No? And I found the gardener also totally motionless. And Where was the gardener? He was in the garage. In the garage next to his bed lying on the floor. Yeah, when this here in this quiet suburb and things here, quiet, a little Ellen Road, a little paradise, and nothing happens. And here you have it right in front of your doorstep. The worst thing what you can imagine. Eh? This family crime is, is a tragic thing. Thank you again. Okay. Okay. Thank you, okay. Thank you Bye -bye. sir. Bye. We see you. Bye. She was German and I'm Zulu and um, uh, English is my second language and I think it's her second language as well. So because we both uh, have an understanding of the English language, then it helped us communicate. I think that English is increasingly um, dominating uh, in international news terms because when we meet people in the townships, people who would be speaking Sisutu language, people who would be speaking in Debele language or Shangan or Zulu or Tosa, um, when they see that we are an international news team, they immediately switch gear and they start speaking in English, however broken it may be, but they try to convey their grievances or their story, try and tell it in such a way that we can understand it in, in, in the best possible way. The role of English as a means of conveying grievances beyond the narrower confines of South Africa's indigenous languages was crucial in the struggle against apartheid. And even Africana leaders admit that the peaceful transition of government to the ANC would not have been possible without the lingua franca. In the negotiation process, English was really the fundamental tool of communication. So many of uh, the leading ANC members have lived so long, as they called it, in exile, that whatever knowledge they had of Afrikaans when they left flew out of the window. The result was that it was really the only language in which we could effectively communicate. It also became in the government of national unity the only language which all of us in the cabinet of national unity could understand and therefore everything was done and is still being done to the best of my knowledge in English. We have been very tolerant that a language that was used by our opp oppressors and colonizers uh, has virtually become a lingua franca that uh, although uh, we are prisoners of of, of history, nevertheless, we are not imprisoned by that history. Uh, and so I think that there's a liberating factor in recognizing 
uh, what is a useful tool uh, and a useful medium for communication. The fact that English has, for a century, been one of the official languages in South Africa, and that a very high percentage of all South Africans can speak or understand it, I think opens the doors to our country. I doubt that South Africa's President Thabo Mbeki would have been the president if he could not speak English. You know, how would he have gone to the United Nations and gave them the, uh, the people's uh, problems and, and grievances and, and struggles and conveyed that message of uh, uh, white oppression. The overwhelming majority of all South Africans realize that it's a world language, it's an important language, especially in uh, the economic field and the field of training. And for that reason, it is to the advantage of South Africa, with its 11 official languages, that English is one of them. In many respects, Europe has a similar problem to South Africa. The European Union is attempting to establish a political union out of nation states where linguistic traditions are even more deeply rooted. Operating with 15 official languages has created a translation culture of immense complexity. When the European Union was just a small group of countries, it was not difficult to maintain five or six languages. But once you get to 11 languages, or 12, or 13, or 15, and soon maybe 21, and then maybe 28, and so we go on, now you have real problems. It is absolutely impossible in financial and let alone practical terms to have 20 equal languages. Equal in the sense that they are all co-equal officially. Often it's impossible to find translator pairs for all the languages of the European Union and so you get the use of relay languages, you know, somebody Greek translates into Finnish via English, you know, Greek into English, English into Finnish. And the problem is going to get worse. Most people uh, in the corridors of power in the European Union um, recognize the reality of the situation and use English. Madam President and the distinguished judges of the Honorable Court, it is a privilege for me to appear before you on behalf of the Turkish government. I remember being told a story once of an official World Bank meeting a few years ago where everybody was being translated simultaneously by the translators uh, uh, quite scrupulously until 10 o'clock in the evening when um, the translators went off duty. A shift was over. The meeting was not over. So everybody just automatically switched into English and carried on the meeting thereafter. Uh, and this happens all the time. This pragmatic acceptance of English as a useful working language seems destined to continue in Europe. But its implications for the policy of linguistic equality are potentially grave. It's crucial now for the European Union to devise ways in which the languages of identity, which are such an important feature of the Union, are given, as it were, equal prominence, are given a kind of status, a position, which means that people can see that respect is being paid towards them and that they're being allowed to develop in the way that the individual communities want. While the United States of Europe grapple with the rise of English, in America, the world's largest English-speaking country, the language has had to weather the influx of millions of non-English-speaking immigrants. The statistics show that in the last decade or so, we have half again as many Spanish speakers in the country as we used to. We have twice as many Chinese speakers or Korean speakers or Vietnamese speakers than we used to, just in a very relatively short period of time. Once they become citizens, they have the right to bring their relatives. So it's a never-ending group of people that are coming and are mostly Hispanic, Spanish-speaking. And that's changing the entire Southwest. The dramatic rise of Hispanic immigration into the United States threatens to change the linguistic character of the country, with a predicted 80 million Spanish speakers by the year 2050. This apparent move away from English is perceived by some Americans as a threat to nationhood and has given rise to the political lobby movement, U.S. English. 
created a situation in the United States where in certain parts of the country you can come and really live without ever having to learn the English language. And that's, that's the first time in our history that that's really the case. I mean, there have always been pockets of immigrants around the country that come and for the first few years they're here, they sort of form little enclaves because that's where they're more, most comfortable and that makes sense. Um, but what we're concerned about is that there is sort of a, an eternal or perennial situation where immigrants come, live, don't ever learn the language, and ultimately what happens is the balkanization of the United States. That's a completely absurd notion uh, that America is becoming balkanized. In the first place, the proportion of speakers of foreign languages now is a quarter what it was at the turn of the 20th century. Uh, and in fact, at the turn of the 20th century, you had large parts of America that were officially bilingual, not in the transitional uh, way that uh, we have in, in, in bilingual education programs and so on, but there, are, there were cities that had two separate and distinct school systems. You could pass your life for one, two, three generations in uh, one of the cities of the Midwest in a farming community of, of Texas without ever having to use English. For generations, people like me came to America and communicated with each other by using our common language, English. But now bureaucrats think they're helping by providing services in foreign languages. What they're really doing is they're taking away the incentive for immigrants to learn English. U.S. English has over a million members saying we don't need to make our government multilingual. Just help immigrants learn English. I'm asked all the time, why does an immigrant from Chile head an organization called U.S. English? And why am I trying to make English the official language? Uh, I am an American. I'm not a Chilean American. I consider myself an American. I'm like millions of other people who came to the United States to become Americans. I know that the language of the country is English. And to me, it's important that we keep communicating with each other. Therefore, I'm trying to make English the official language. Now, there's a movement called English Only in this country that I totally applaud. Uh, I think that if a child, for example, of a Hispanic family is put into an English immersion program, they will pick the language up very quickly, and then after that, they can begin their regular courses in English. Uh, that in no wise denigrates their cultural heritage or the fact that they might speak Spanish at home. But I, I, I think that they will be condemned to be second-class citizens in, in a predominantly English-speaking nation unless they learn the language. So if we're really compassionate for the Hispanic population, we will insist that they learn English. Uh, we're, not, we're not discriminating against them, we're helping them. We think the best way to prevent xenophobia is to welcome immigrants but insist that they learn English quickly and that they become Americans and have their identity as Americans, not their identity as hyphenated Americans and not their identity as, you know, or worse, you know, their identity as, or as Italians or as Germans or as Mexicans. We think that when you get here, your identity should be as an American. The countries of the English-speaking world have never defined themselves primarily in terms of language, certainly not in the official level. And my concern about the present movement is that it really seeks to redefine American identity, not in terms of a common commitment to a set of political values, what Jefferson called the great experiment, but rather to make us a nation uh, like every other nation, like the Slovaks or, or the, the Czechs or the Croats and so on, defined around a narrow cultural and linguistic background. And I think that's a, a terrible mistake, and in a certain sense, a betrayal of what America has always stood for. In some states, you can take your driver's license test in as many as 33 languages, and you don't even have to understand English. So much for traffic signs. With over a million members, U.S. English is the largest organization fighting to make English the official language of our government. Join us before it's too late. In the meantime, may we suggest you look twice before crossing the street. Unless you know English, you're going to be frying eggs or parking cars in the United States. To get a decent job, an immigrant or a person needs to speak English. And they're being told by their leaders, uh, no, you don't need to learn the language of the country. You know, we'll take care of you. We'll give you whatever you need. Buenas tardes. Su nombre? Francisco Luque. We know for a fact that the average day work 
of a Mexican laborer is 13 hours a day. Uh, they work in the most difficult jobs, and whoever wants for them to learn English after 13 hours a day of hard labor, then to travel one hour to get to a school, to study two hours, what I would wish them is that they would work 13 hours and then try to learn the foreign language. The first generation, the people who clean this building, for instance, who come in in the evenings uh, with brooms to clean this building, uh, are people who are working nights. They're working with other Hispanics. Uh, they're living in largely Hispanic neighborhoods. Some of them are undocumented and nervous about going to, uh, to English classes. And uh, also, it's just hard to learn a language uh, very competently in the first generation. The second generation is the generation to watch. We believe that the moment they get here, they ought to be taught English. And that doesn't mean that, that they can never hear their native language in the classroom, but it means that the overwhelming majority of their instruction is in the English language. Currently, there are 25 states of our union that have an official English law. Uh, there's a 26th that has that issue on their ballot this November in Utah, and we think uh, that, that it will pass. So uh, we think that's an important step. I got a call maybe three, four days after that legislation passed from a court of law asking us for an interpreter. They had somebody that spoke Spanish. And I said, well, you know, we can't go against the law. You can't speak Spanish in the court. Uh, it's an English-only uh, state now. And he said, I don't give a damn about what laws are this or that. We need somebody. We need to help this person. We need to understand what they're saying. Could you please send an interpreter? It showed right away how ridiculous this thing was. What do you mean English only? What you need to do is to communicate. The entire English only movement is based on what's simply a canard, this idea that immigrants don't want to learn English or don't recognize its importance. They're not stupid. It's about the people of the country being united in spirit. And if we don't have a common language, and if we don't go in the direction of assimilation, then we will not truly be a United States, and that would sadden me and, and many Americans greatly. My own feeling is that, uh, you know, that sense of diversity and equality in this country is strong enough that uh, Americans are going to embrace it and at some point think it's a good deal. And we're also marketplace oriented enough so that if it improves our music and the food is better and there are places to go that are different and more lively and all of that. I mean, these are easy things for Americans to wrap their arms around. The debate between Spanish and English in the United States is a clash between two of the world's major languages, and neither survival is seriously in question. However, as languages like English, Spanish, Hindi, and Chinese continue to grow, thousands of others face extinction. The figures vary a bit, but people think there are something like 6,000 or so languages in the world. Of these, half of those languages, some 3,000 or so, are thought to be so seriously endangered that they are going to die out within the next 100 years. Some people think it's going to be less than that. Some people say it might be only as little as 25%. Some people say it's going to be as much as 80 or 90% of the world's languages. In Kyoto, Japan, Academics from around the world gathered to debate the issues surrounding this cultural catastrophe. It gives me great pleasure to welcome the researchers from 11 countries overseas. People say that 90% of the world's languages might disappear in the next 100 years. Now, if it were the case that 90% of plants or 90% of animal species were, were, were that threatened, can you imagine what the ecological outcry would be? And yet this is something that's even more central to humanity. This is our, con this is our concepts, this is our identity, this is our categorization, this is our knowledge of the world. It's a very poignant situation and a lot of languages are inevitably going to die. Um, we don't really know which ones those are and in, in, in these circumstances. Um, it really does depend on, on the response that there is in different communities. People say we don't need our ancestral languages. You know, English is the language of opportunity. But when, when we go home, you feel almost crying because you can't communicate with your grandfather, grandmother, uh, unless, you know, grandparents speak English. English is the world's most dangerous language because many countries are shifting educational systems away from 
learning some language of the region towards learning English. Where most of the people speak one language, which is C. Every major national language is endangering the languages within that country. That is why it is sometimes difficult for the people to realize the preciousness of using their mother tongue. Most of the languages that are endangered are endangered in the sense that they're about to disappear from the face of the earth. But the language that I'm dealing with is uh, an indigenous language that's out on an island, the Bonin Islands in the middle of the Pacific. They're the descendants of Yankee whalers and European uh, adventurers that went there in the 19th century. And they speak English on the island and they use that as a part of their identity. So in this world where we think of English taking over the world and replacing all of these other smaller languages, and it is, and that's a real problem. Uh, and it's the irony of the situation is that to them in their small community, English is their language and it's disappearing, it's being uh, taken over by Japanese. The steamrollers that are crushing these languages are any dominant language that arrives in a country, in a culture, where there are, by definition, minority languages threatened now by that major language. In South America, for example, the Indian languages have been dying for hundreds of years, not because of English, but because of Spanish and Portuguese. And there have been lots of languages uh, endangered by Arabic and Chinese and, and uh, Russian and so on and so forth. Ultimately, all the solutions are going to have to come um, from the willingness and the enthusiasm of the people in those different communities to go on rejoicing in their own traditions. In this valley in Northern California, three Native American tribes, the Hoopa, Kuruk, and Yuruk, are trying to preserve their individual languages against the depredations of English. These native languages, which have described a way of life for centuries, are now struggling to find a place in a world dominated by English. All of the fluent speakers today they're all in their 70s, 80s, and some are still alive in their 90s. There was a tremendous gap there that the language was not passed on because of the efforts of the federal system to basically eliminate the Indian culture in the early part of the century. In a deliberate attempt to destroy Native American culture, government policy compelled parents to send their children to so-called Indian boarding schools, where under often cruel and abusive regimes, they were systematically stripped of their culture, traditions, and language. I was one of them that uh, was in this crowd when playing marbles, when the lady came out there and told us, told, I think it was one of the hostler boys, he was talking the language, and then uh, she came out there and said, well, are you speaking your language? She said, yes, and he started to laugh. Well, she said, next time I hear you talk that language, I'll rub soap in your mouth. And that scared everybody. So we had no chance. Although the boarding school system has long ceased, the damage to native languages has been devastating. When we look at the English language and what it has done for us and to us and the genocidal issues around the language, because you take away the language, you take away the heart. So I think that there is a clash. It's a devastating clash. And if we don't recognize that and start working towards building our own languages as a first language, it's going to continue to be so. I believe that the values that we speak of when we talk about the language, I think that they're eternal. Um, you know, we, who, as Hupa people, we say, and that means, I'm glad that you've done good by me. And that would be translated in the English language to mean, thank you. And that's, a tr that's one of our values, that you are always giving and that you... Um, behave appropriately, you do what's expected of you, and that's to be a good person and to be giving and to help your, your neighbor or to help your um, family member or somebody else that's in need. And I think that those values are the values that are really adherent in the Hupa language. Your thought process is different. Like there's no word for a goodbye. You just say, Kiet Nusiste, I'll see you again. 
our sense of direction is also different. We don't have a true east, west, north, or south. Our directions are based on the river, up the river, down the river, across the river, uphill, downhill. Like for east would be uh, you knock it, you duck, up the river and up the hill. The name of this place, this is Takamisting. That means the place where they stir up the acorns when they're cooking them. Uh, we used to have an acorn ceremony, first acorns, and that was one of the ceremonies that were held here. Hoja Junta. That's where, like, the little kids and women, they would sleep together in there. And then the Hoja Taiku, the sweat house, the men and older boys, they would sleep in there. My grandma, she was a fluent speaker, but um, she went to the Chamawa Indian boarding school. You know, it's kind of a horrendous story, actually, but uh, they they pretty much got you know got it beat into them you know, to not speak their language. So she didn't pass it on to my father. So I've been picking it up from elders that comes in our class. You can preserve a language, you can document it, videotape, audio tape, write it down, but all you're doing is preserving it for some study at some future point, whereas communication means using it now, making it relevant to people here so that they use it every day. We have been trying to revitalize our language so that it, it's fluent in the homes. And we started at a very young age. And this process has only been going on for about 12 to 15 years. Can you tell me what this is? It's a dog. No, canayo. Good, Tristan. And this one? The educational system of this country helped to squash languages and now here at least it's the same institution that is helping to bring it back, which is a, a wonderful irony. What we try to teach our children and what we try to pass on is that when you know who you are, when you know where you come from, and you can connect yourself with those people who have gone before you, then you, you can do anything, that you, you can succeed because you have a strong foundation. It's when you don't have that connection with your ancestors, when you don't have that connection with the land or that connection with this community here, that's when you have a difficult time going out into the dominant society and actually succeeding because it's very different. How long have you been learning the language, Eric? Well, I just started this year. Yeah? Is it difficult? Uh, it's difficult because, you know, it's pronounced different in English. You gotta learn new sounds and all that, but it's not really that hard. I like learning it because you know it's my language. And that's where I'm from. It's our people's language, and it's gone away. And we're trying to get it back, fighting to get it back. More people are starting to learn it. And do your family speak it? Uh, try to teach them some. They learn some quick, but still trying. And do you speak it with your friends now? Uh, sometimes walk to the hall. Say a couple words. I've been learning about 10 years now. Do you think you're going to attain fluency in the language? I kind of go back and forth. Sometimes I think I will and sometimes I think I won't. It's, it's really difficult. It's a very difficult thing. Because it, it goes beyond just memorizing, you know, lists of words. You actually have to figure out a whole grammatical different structure, the way that we put things together in Hoopa is nothing at all like English. Today we're going to talk about a little bit about numbers. Let's count. Flock, knock, talk, dink, chwola, hostan, hokit, kenam, makostal, smintlang. Flock it in one more time. I'm teaching around 500 children. Talk. Some are very enthusiastic, others could take or leave it. Um, it's only a half hour per week, per class, not enough time to learn a language. We only teach it once, once a week. We, I would like to see it every day. It's in the school, but you've got to be fluent. 
to speak that language. You got people that speak in here that really is not fluent. So a lot of the words that they they got there, they they don't pronounce the right, not the way we do. It's very difficult to imitate uh, the fluency and the the exact dialect of a native speaker. So we're imitating. We're imitators. But that's all we have. As long as we're here, as long as the valley is here, as long as our culture is alive, the language and teaching the language will be a part of what we do. It's our responsibility. Let's take our canoe and go down the river. Ready? If it's up to me, this language is going to go on. Um, like I said, I could be doing more, but I have done a lot. And um, I want the language to be more of a home setting where it's actually used in the home again. It'd even be neat to have the tribe have a bilingualism on the reservation. But that's going to take a while and it's going to take a lot of hard work. But that's my goal. They work on it, the kids work on it, and I think they can make it. I, I'm quite sure. We did. I don't see why we're no different, you know. Yeah. I'm hopeful, but concerned, deeply concerned. Because if it doesn't happen within the next five years, we may very well lose our language with the exception of this, our dictionary. And I understand that there are languages that can be revived by just the word. But, you know, how effective is that without the speakers?